This is Avdivka, a small city in southeastern Ukraine that is currently a hot spot in the Russo-Ukrainian war and the focus of Russia's main offensive efforts. Avdivka is a heavily fortified frontline settlement, complete with trench systems, firing positions, and concrete reinforced bunkers. In these days, it's one place on the front line where you definitely don't want to be assigned if you're a Russian soldier. On October 10th, 2023, Russian forces attempted to encircle the city of Avdivka and cut off its supply lines, sending a huge wave of tanks and armored personnel carriers in a surprise attack designed to overwhelm the area's defenses. The attack didn't exactly go as planned. Ukrainian defenses were dug in deep, and almost the entire wave of Russian attacking forces was annihilated, with reports ranging from dozens to over a hundred Russian vehicles being destroyed in a single day of fighting, and with very little progress for Russia to show. After its initial assault, Russian forces didn't quite take the message. Continued attempts were made to encircle the city, at first with more vehicles, and then with continuous, unprotected infantry waves once the Russians realized how quickly they were losing equipment. Within a few months, by the end of December 2023, the losses had become truly devastating for the Russian army, making it one of the deadliest battlefields of the entire conflict. U.S. sources, using a combination of drone and satellite imagery, were able to confirm over 13,000 Russian casualties here, along with 411 pieces of destroyed Russian heavy equipment that had been lost over the course of the battle. Ukraine, for its part, was considerably better off, suffering a few thousand casualties, or around a 1 to 5 loss ratio when compared to the Russians. As for military vehicles, the loss ratio was over 1 to 10 as the Ukrainians had lost just 30 pieces of heavy equipment compared to Russia's loss of over 400. These skewed numbers are very telling, and truly staggering, but they didn't appear out of thin air. The reason for the Ukrainian success was simple. They had the defensive advantage, and were able to resist the waves of Russian attacks from afar. Using a combination of artillery strikes and drone attacks to blunt the vast majority of the assaults before they ever even came within range of Ukrainian trenches. And when Russian forces did manage to get up close, they found themselves facing one of the most heavily fortified cities in all of Ukraine. One that has been digging in its heels since at least 2014, and an area that has more experience than most when it comes to resisting Russian advances. So why, you might ask, is Russia so intently focused on taking this city, willing to bear a 5 to 1 loss ratio and lose staggering amounts of heavy equipment, and yet to continue pushing soldiers into the funnel? And why attack a place that is so heavily fortified, instead of using those same forces against a softer target for more meaningful gains? The answer lies only partially in the city's strategic importance. As a fortress city, Avdivka is located right next door to nearby Russian-occupied Donetsk, a place that has been the center of the Russo-Ukrainian war since long before Putin's more famous invasion of 2022, and which has been at least partially occupied by either Russian soldiers or Russian-backed separatists, or both, since all the way back in 2014. Due to its close proximity to Donetsk, a city that once had a population of nearly a million people, but has since become one of the fastest depopulating cities on the planet. Avdivka has been described as a gateway to Ukrainian operations in the region, one that theoretically gives Ukraine a foothold from which they could launch artillery strikes or ground invasions against Donetsk City in a future counteroffensive. Avdivka is also a frustrating position for Russian logistics in the Donetsk region, one that makes the movement of Russian troops and supplies in the area more difficult. And if Russia wins here, it could theoretically take pressure off of them so they can focus on other regions. So there is some strategic military value. But while all of these things are true, most of them are more or less true of any other position near the front line, most of which are much less fortified than Avdivka and would therefore be much easier for Russia to capture. So, most military analysts believe that the Russian capture of Avdivka would not have a strategic impact on Russia's overall war efforts, or at least not a significant enough strategic impact to justify the massive cost that Russia is paying for it by sending wave after wave of men to try to capture it quickly. Instead, to discover the true reason why Russia is so willing to batter its troops against Avdivka's defenses, one has to look a bit deeper. 
and gain an understanding of why this city is so heavily fortified in the first place. And why Avdivka, not a significant military objective, is very politically significant for Russia. Something that they absolutely cannot end the war without capturing. This goes all the way back to the true beginning of the war in Ukraine. A brief explanation of which will help you understand why Russia wants Avdivka so badly today. Contrary to popular belief, Russia's war against Ukraine did not start with Putin's famous invasion of 2022. It actually started at least eight years earlier, in Crimea, and in the Donetsk region that Avdivka itself is a part of. During 2014, following Russia's invasion and annexation of Crimea, Russia was making parallel moves in other regions of Ukraine to distract Ukraine's limited military forces and make it difficult for them to retaliate. Because while Ukraine could prevent further Russian advances from the chokehold of the Crimean Peninsula rather easily, the same could not be said of much of their eastern regions. To buy themselves time to fortify Crimea, and time to enact demographic changes in the region that were more favorable to long-term Russian control, Russia needed Ukraine to shift its focus somewhere else. Somewhere that they were more vulnerable. And Russia saw their opportunity in the form of backing local separatist groups and inflaming them to become militant. As Ukrainian forces were planning how to respond to the occupation of Crimea, which occurred in February and March of 2014, in April of the same year, before Ukraine had a chance to make a move, separatist forces took advantage of the crisis and began to capture Ukrainian government buildings in the Donetsk and Luhansk regions, declaring them to be independent states. But even at these early stages, the separatists made some key mistakes revealing their true identities, such as in Kharkiv, where protesters stormed the local theater thinking it was the city hall and revealing that while they wanted to be seen as disgruntled locals, the vast majority of them actually knew nothing about the local area or infrastructure, mainly because they were, presumably, not ethnically Russian Ukrainians, but actual Russians. This is seen by many as the true start of the Russo-Ukrainian War, which began with armed separatists and undercover Russian operatives, who were often one and the same, and an effort by Ukraine to recapture its territory from Russian-backed control. And the major focus of the efforts took place around the city of Donetsk, right next door to where the modern-day Battle of Avdivka is still currently taking place, something which, in a minute, you will see is very important to this analysis and to understanding the significance of this city to the mind of the modern-day Russian government. At first, it seemed as if the conflict might be short-lived. By August, Ukrainian forces had recaptured most of their territory, and the separatist groups, which were in reality extremely small, were close to being completely defeated. But things then changed quickly. In response to the waning strength of their new client states, Russian tanks and artillery then began to enter the Donbass, not in 2022, but in 2014, reinforcing and re-energizing separatist efforts. How many Russian troops entered the fight is difficult to say, but Alexander Borodai, leader of the separatists in the Donetsk region, once stated that 50,000 Russian volunteers had fought alongside his forces in the first five months of the conflict. Other sources include OSCE observers, who counted 30,000 people in military gear crossing over from Russia into the separatist regions to reinforce them. And this was just at the two border checkpoints they were allowed to monitor. The point is, Russians began to enter the war, a lot of them, leading to a new, bloody stage of the conflict that had previously been coming close to a peaceful settlement, and which would ensure Ukraine remained destabilized so that it could not make strategic moves like joining NATO to preempt an additional Russian invasion. With these influxes of Russian soldiers, Ukraine quickly lost much of the territory that they had managed to recapture by August of 2014. But as the fighting raged on, eventually the movement began to brush up against fortified cities, especially the fortified city of Avdivka. Unable to penetrate these fortresses, and frankly being too scared to even try, the conflict became dragged into a standstill and the Russian-backed separatists were prevented from making further progress, becoming locked into a front line that still exists in many ways in the current day, with Avdivka and Donetsk at the forefront. In 2016, Ukraine then experienced its first full year of losing no further territory, due in part to their strong positions in places like Avdivka, and the ability those fortresses gave them to exercise control over the surrounding region. 
With the situation stabilizing, peace talks then began once more, and a ceasefire was put in place, the tenth one of the conflict. But in a theme that you will see repeat itself over and over in this part of the world, Russia could not allow a ceasefire to happen, because peace in the region was not their goal. Russian-provoked separatists then violated the ceasefire and attempted to take Avdivka by surprise in January of 2017. They failed and lost two of their top commanders in the process, with the third being wounded, leading to a catastrophic impact on the chain of command that never really fully recovered. Overall, after failing to take Avdivka, the separatist movement slowed to almost a halt. Following the failed attack, the casualty rate of the conflict decreased drastically falling to an average of one Ukrainian soldier dying every third day, and then reduced again to a total of 50 Ukrainian soldiers dying throughout all of 2020, something that was looking more like local gang disputes than a true full-scale war. Ukraine had made a show of force, and it was working, slowly bringing peace to the region, along with a series of treaties and reforms that were empowered by that peace. For local separatists in Donetsk, those few who were true separatists, and not just Russian operatives, Avdivka became an infamous city, one that would always need to be taken for them to accomplish their future goals, but a city that they understood they themselves would never be able to take alone. Avdivka became a symbol of continued Ukrainian sovereignty over the area, positioned right on the front line, tauntingly right outside the capital of the Donetsk separatist region. And as long as it stood in place, it was a sign that Ukraine did not intend to give up on its territories, and that Donetsk could not truly separate from Ukraine and join Russia, as Putin had hoped. It became apparent that the Kremlin's goals of annexing the region were not going to be met without further efforts, and the gains Russia had made to this point were at risk of being lost. So in 2021, after the conflict had essentially ended aside from a few embers that were now being put out, Russia once again began in earnest to agitate the separatists into action, and began to go a step further, building up tanks and snipers in the area around Donetsk. Finally, in 2022, when Russia decided to stop pretending like it wasn't involved, and launched its full-scale public invasion of Ukraine, Avdivka was one of its first targets, a city on the front lines from the very beginning, and still on the front lines to this very day. Throughout the entire conflict, Avdivka has stubbornly held its ground, the fortifications that stopped the advancing separatists still serving to stop the advances of the Russian army, at least for now. And without being captured, Avdivka would make it impossible for Russia to fully exercise its separatist agenda in the surrounding region, not just for military reasons, but perhaps primarily for psychological ones. This is incredibly important because it speaks to an often forgotten aspect of what will happen if Russia does manage to win the war. After the lines on maps wound to a halt, a victorious Russia would then have to govern the regions it captured, and to give those people a good reason to submit to Russian control, they would need a plausible reason to portray themselves as their liberators. This is something that is very hard to do when you can still see the forces of your home country just a few kilometers away sitting in a fortress always with the threat of a conflict breaking out once again. So as long as Avdivka holds, Russia will not be able to portray itself as a victorious power to the people of Donetsk, since if they fail to capture Avdivka, they show themselves to be no more powerful than the original separatist movement that called for Russian help. And those in Donetsk who remain loyal to Ukraine will always see the nearby city as a reason to continue fighting in resistance. If the war ends with Russia failing to take Avdivka, the separatist people of Donetsk do not gain anything, but actually lose quite a lot from Russia's involvement, as all Russia will have managed to do from their perspective is put an aggravated Ukrainian army at their border, who they had previously been coming to peace terms with. Russia may have gained other territories, but that only matters for Russia, not for the people of Donetsk. And they will start to feel like pawns in Russia's game, like they really are rather than a people who has been liberated by them. On the other hand, if Russia manages to capture Avdivka, it becomes a symbol that they are a liberating force that was able to break through the barriers that had previously stopped the Donetsk separatists in their tracks. Russia needs these locals on their side if they want their occupation to be successful, so they need to capture Avdivka to give the separatists a compelling reason to support them. 
This raises a few possibilities for Russia's seemingly irrational moves around the area. One plausible option is that Russia may be attempting to capture this territory to put itself in a better position if they end up signing a peace treaty where they are allowed to keep the Donetsk Oblast, a peace condition that Ukraine has repeatedly denied, but which is still theoretically possible in the future. Without Avdivka, such a peace treaty could be a poisoned chalice for Russia, with unfulfilled objectives fresh in the minds of the Russian people, and especially in the minds of those living in the occupied region that Russia had supposedly liberated. So Russia may be desperately attempting to take the city while they still can, to prepare the way for the occupation of the region. Another plausible option is that capturing Avdivka is supposed to serve as a sort of election gift for Putin, giving him a strong propaganda narrative where he could show that he fulfilled his promise and liberated the ethnic Russians of Donetsk from supposed Ukrainian oppression by deleting the city that had previously blunted their movement's forward progress. This would, of course, just be talking points. And predictably, Russian propaganda would skirt over the heavy cost at which the city was taken, and the inconvenient fact that more ethnic Russians have died at the hands of the Russian military trying to take Avdivka than were ever threatened by Ukraine and Donetsk in the first place. But the fact is, Russian propaganda could hide those facts, and that means this would be a good narrative for Putin to continue garnering domestic support for his war. The goal here wouldn't be to help him win an election, which is almost certainly already rigged, but to ensure that any motivations for his opponents to form a coup were kept to a minimum. There are many other plausible options that all fall along the same theme. Capturing Avdivka allows the Russians to show progress and frame the war as a victory. And it's especially critical to Russia's ability to show progress against their main objective, proving that the conquest of the Donbass is possible. But whatever the specific intent of that propaganda, whether for one or all of these options, it is clear that political reasons have to be the main intent behind the pressure on the city. Because from a military standpoint, the continued Russian losses here simply make no sense. Even if purely from a tactical point of view, for a government that doesn't care about its troops on a human level. Russian leaders have said on several occasions that they are in the war for the long term, implying that they view the war as a war of attrition, where they will trade troops, equipment, and ammunition in small battles, and ultimately outlast the Ukrainian will and ability to fight. And this could be a genuine possibility if Ukraine does not receive sufficient support from its Western partners. But Russia's actions in Avdivka run counter to this narrative. In a real war of attrition, a competent army would constantly be trying to create opportunities to eliminate enemy troops and equipment without risking too much of their own. For Russia, this could mean constant bombardments from artillery, rockets, missiles, or drones, where in time, the sheer size of their economy and the resources they have access to would outproduce Ukraine's economy and eventually lead to a massive Russian advantage. In a true war of attrition, this kind of patient approach would ensure that sufficient troops remained in place to exploit holes as soon as they began to appear. But by assaulting Evdivka, Russia is effectively eliminating this advantage for itself by allowing Ukraine to continually wear down on its fighting forces, and especially on its heavy equipment. Russia may not care about the 5 to 1 loss ratio for their men, because of the kind of people their leaders have proven to be, but they should at least care about the 10 to 1 loss ratio of their equipment, something that includes not just machinery that is difficult to replace, but also experienced crews that cannot be quickly trained, crews they would need to press a tactical advantage in the future. Based on these factors, some analysts, such as Peter Zihan, have estimated that Russia could keep up these rates of losses for a maximum of four to five years. That might sound like a long time, but it really isn't, because it assumes the total exhaustion of Russian military forces, with no capability being left over for future campaigns, and no reserves left over for defense, not to mention other battles in the same war. When considering those factors, the current burn rate of Russian troops is actually very unsustainable. And if Russia truly intends to let this war continue on a long-term scale, assaulting Avdivka the way they are is a very foolish choice. So, where does that leave us? My current personal opinion, which is of course subject to change based on how the facts on the ground progress, is that Russia's goal is to try to take Avdivka just before Putin's election, no matter the cost. I believe they will then try to push as far as they possibly can in the summer leading up to the 2024 U.S. presidential elections, to sow the idea in the mind of American voters that the war in Ukraine cannot be won. 
with the hope that this will then result in the U.S. ending support for Ukraine, and potentially even the U.S. leaving NATO. Russia will then potentially sue for peace based on its occupation of whatever territories it holds at the time. Then, if their peace terms are accepted, they will reinforce, regroup, and attack somewhere else in the near future. That could mean further attacks in Ukraine, or perhaps in the Baltic states if the U.S. leaves NATO, or somewhere else. But one thing this war has shown is that no matter how costly it is for them, Russia's leadership has not lost their appetite for expansion. Putin only has so much longer to live. And in the time he has left, he wants to build his legacy. It's now up to Western leaders and their ability to see their support of Ukraine through to the end to determine what ends up happening. If Western leaders do choose to offer sufficient support, Avdivka makes for a perfect trap for Russia. Ukraine could afford to lose control of the city in whole or in part, but Russia absolutely cannot afford to let Avdivka stand unconquered. And as long as that is true, Ukraine can continue to pick off Russian forces here and turn the war of attrition, something that should be against them, into a situation that is vastly in their favor. If you're a voter, it's potentially up to you what happens next. This episode was made possible by my supporters on Patreon and my YouTube channel members, who continue to make the research and animation in these videos possible. Patrons enjoy special benefits, like the ability to suggest video topics and access to previous versions of my videos that I'm not able to post on YouTube. If you enjoy these videos and want to help support more of them, you can learn more by clicking the link in the description, or by clicking the membership tab on my YouTube channel page. I'm deeply appreciative to all of my awesome patrons. The battlefield footage of Avdivka used in this video was provided by United24. For more first-hand accounts of the war in Ukraine, visit United24's YouTube channel using the link in the description, or watch their video linked here. <laughs>